Uh, there are a couple of quick introductions I'd love to make. Uh, we have two of, well, we have a lot of the greatest thinkers in the country here, but two that are fairly well known uh, amongst the conservative world and really beyond. Uh, one of whom you're going to hear from later tonight with our Kathleen White about their new book. Steve Moore has joined us of Fox News and the Heritage Foundation, founder of Club for Growth. Uh, Steve's pedigree goes so far back in terms of what he has done and meant for this movement of freedom and liberty. And Steve, it is always a pleasure to have you. Steve is also newly married, which is very exciting. Congratulations. He got married on the steps of the Jefferson Memorial uh, just a couple weeks ago. So we're very glad you're here. Nowhere better than to honeymoon than Austin, Texas at the Climate Summit, right? <laughs> welcome, welcome. Without your wife, even. Perfect. Uh, and the, uh, the second person I want to introduce, who many of you will recognize his name, is Ovik Roy. And Ovik is opinion editor at Forbes.com. They have 72 million viewers, visitors a month. Think about that, 72 million. Ovik, if you'll please say hello. Really great to have you. Uh, he and Steve, and I'm about to introduce Kathleen officially, have such great um, resumes and such an incredible breadth and depth of, depth of experience. The only thing that none of them share is that none of them have uh, went to Texas A&M, which... You were married on the same day? Oh, you're even celebrating. He's not to each other. Not to each No, this is Texas. Not to each other. Um, so Ovik's even celebrating his wedding in Austin at the Climate Summit. This is so fun. But uh, anyway, great to have you all. And uh, again, the combined intellect in, in this room is a little mind boggling um, to the ag major from Texas A&M. But I'd like to now introduce the director of our Center for Energy and the Environment. I've mentioned her several times. Most of you have met her. She's going to just give a couple of comments and introduce the real star for tonight, who is Mark Mills. Kathleen, as I mentioned, joined us eight years ago, for those of you who were here at lunch, and she could have gone and done a million things as the former chair of the TCEQ. And let me tell you a little bit about the TCEQ. They have 3,000 employees and a $600 million budget. They are Texas's EPA in a much different way. Uh, Kathleen, who served under Rick Perry and George Bush, has been a stalwart for these issues for many, many years. A degree from Stanford, a degree from Princeton. Uh, she has been writing and speaking on the issues of which we are talking today and tomorrow for a long time. And I am so proud and honored and so privileged to get to work with Kathleen every single day. She and her husband, Bo, uh, are breeders of national champion Jack Russell Terriers, which is fabulous. And um, they live in Bastrop County, but she is from a ranching family. Both of them are in far west Texas. And uh, it's just such a pleasure to have Bo, you too. The, the great, great work that you both do as a couple and Kathleen, you do for this organization and for all of us is a great blessing. Please help me welcome Kathleen White. Minds feel a little full with all the uh, information and data um, that you've, um, you've had today. Hard, it is hard to absorb at one time. I might add um, just a detail that all these fabulous presentations will be on the TPPF website um, shortly after this, so they will be a resource for everybody. Um, I, I'm going to read a, a, a quote of uh, someone whose writings I really value on these issues. I know our uh, speaker from England, Rupert Darwell, will know Michael Kelly of the Royal Society, um, Royal Society of Engineers, very, very uh, senior, highly respected. I'm going to read it because it kind of encapsulates what we're trying to do in this conference. Um, <coughs> he notes, a decarbonized global economy is going to have to, to outperform the achievement of fossil fuels. If not, mankind's progress 
progress will have to go into reverse in terms of an aggregate standard of living. We should be honest and upfront about the sheer scale and the enormity of the challenge implied by decarbonization, which it, to me was a laughable word. It's used so seriously by our president, among other policymakers. But that's our intention. I think in this, these issues or this single issue um, about climate change and, and, and anthropogenic global warming, as I think has been said by a number of the speakers, it's, it's the problem is not the science, if you will. The problem is the, the recommended policy solu solutions. Um, but I think that our, our policymakers in Washington, D.C., and average, very interested citizens um, have no idea of the scale and the enormity um, of this challenge. Um, and I want to mention just one point about what I call the dark side of these issues, um, and then uh, some of what I see the very optimistic uh, part of these issues, and then um, Mark Mills will give his keynote. I didn't come to uh, this opinion easily at all because I think it's some um, statements that are easy to ex exaggerate. Um, but all the um, climate policies to avert the claimed problem um, all assume a much more powerful, bigger, centralized government. Um, as, as, as in Texas, we know the Clean Power Plan would mean in this state. And when you pour over the daily inflow of all this information about um, the issue, and particularly as we get closer to the Paris talks, um, many of the, the senior decision makers um, in the climate area, like the chief of the United Nations Climate Program, Christina Figueres, if I uh, pronounced her last name, are really quite open about what, what their goal is. Um, she publicly stated multiple times that communism, and she uses Chinese communism as the example, um, offers the effective and maybe the only effective model to really achieve um, the goals of reducing CO2 by whatever amount is, um, um, is thought to um, avoid climate disaster. And, and many talk about, you know, this is finally an issue we can use to destroy capitalism that in, in uh, those parties' opinion not only ravage the natural environment but is, quote, unfair. That's their, I think it should be chilling because I can remember years ago when some of my friends, even more conservative than I, I they call them the, the UN helicopter paranoids, you know, they, they were going to land on our property and, and take control of us. And, um, um, that's not what I'm talking about, but I, this is, I think, a very, very sobering, sobering um, implication. And another one of our fabulous speakers, if you ever want to read the history that has led to that, as far as the ideology, is uh, Rupert Darwall. Who, Rupert, are you in here? Are you in the? There you are, right in front of me. Whose book? And it's been mentioned, but it's a fabulous book, The Age of Global Warming. It's a historical um, book and uh, invaluable. But on the happy front, and Mark P. Mills will share some of this, this, and there'll be more about this tomorrow, not too much in the panels today. The crossroads, that is the name of this conference, what are, what, what are the crossroads? What are the two things? One is the, um, um, the threat of very, very damaging uh, policies implemented um, supposedly to avert global warming. Um, that have never been so institutionalized. That's what, that's what I think is worrisome. They're, they're insti more institutionalized in law and in a country which has very enforceable um, uh, authority to force compliance with the law, I think, than anywhere else um, in the world. Um, <clears throat> that is occurring right now at the same time of a prodigious energy revolution, the shale revolution, is occurring. It's rather an odd coincidence. Um, and I, I think the shale revolution is also something, the importance of which or the magnitude of which is not really appreciated um, by, a, by a lot of people. I'll just say one thing about that, and those professionals in the in industry may correct me if I don't get this right, but think about it. What the sh shale revolution accomplished, and by the way, a, 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 an achievement not of government policy or ministers of oil from OPEC countries, but by um, small independent energy companies and the, the, the trailblazers of which are sitting in this room, I'm proud to say. Um, <laughs> 
It's not nice we don't have a minister of oil. We have, by various estimates, three to 4,000 um, energy companies competing in a free market. It's nice. It's like the invisible hand <laughs> has, actually, um, has actually returned. But um, petroleum geologists call the source rock, and that's what shale is, the hard rock in which hydrocarbons are, are still forming, still forming over millions of years. Some of those, as they become liquid and gaseous, um, through gravity and a geological pressure and all those sort of things, end up in pools. And that was conventional drilling, where, and to overly simplistic, the, the, the oil is extracted, um, it's pumped, yes, but largely by natural pressure. Um, various estimates of how much oil does that conventional drilling get out of a certain geological formation, and I look at Jim Henry, the expert, I'm sure there's a great difference in different geological formations. But it can be only 3% being able to uh, access um, the oil and natural gas in shale has sped up the geological process by millions of years. So the access, what's ever happening with energy prices, what's ever happening in the world, th that discovery to have access to the source rock is unbelievable, unbelievable. And so what another theme of this, uh, of this conference is also that prodigious opportunity and uh, should never be, that to me, that can't make sense out of the other issue um, or in the importance of, um, of trying to <coughs> resolve it, that if you have this other side, what incredible opportunity this means uh, for our country and I think the world um, to become, or in supply, we are the world's uh, superpowers. 2013, United States of America, the largest producer of, of, of oil and natural gas combined, largest energy producer in the world. How many, seven presidents said they were going to get that done? And people like Jim Henry and Bud Brigham, they got it done. It just, to me, it's, it's very chilling. And it's also how, how free markets, how economic freedom, how, how property rights actually work in a way federal programs can't possibly imagine because they stultify innovation and drive. So I just wanted to get that positive message up. And now to introduce Mark P. Mills. And many of you, I think, were in the, the last session today where Mark spoke, so he was introduced. But he also wins the award at this conference for submitting the uh, briefest bio. <laughs> it, it, it is, uh, let's see here, it's five, it's five lines, it's five lines long, um, as opposed to much, much longer. But um, if you haven't read his, his, his frequent editorials in Forbes, you must. If you haven't read his book, published 2005, Mark, uh, The Bottomless Well, The Virtue of Waste, which is, you know, s an interesting <laughs> perspective. Waste, what was the rest of it? The Virtue of Waste? Twilight of Fuel. And Twilight of Fuel. And Why We Will Never Run Out of Energy. And not too, not too many pages back from the cover, at the end of The bo Bottomless Well, and this is paraphrase, it's not quoting, I can't remember, at the end of The Bottomless Well is not oil, but logic, the human brain, the human will, the capacity for crea creation. It's a, it's, a, it's a fabulous book, and I heard an inkling that it may be um, updated and, and republished again with his co-author at, at that time, Peter Huber. But his insights on any of these energy problems or climate science, it, he never fails to have insights in, in just these editorials in Forbes and in his longer papers. He has, as he mentioned in the, uh, uh, se the past session, but just so that the rest of you will know, he has in the, in the l recent past two fabulous studies. And boy, and it's not only, not only insightful, it just kind of wakes provocative, it wakes you up. Uh, the eye cloud begins with coal fascinating about the, the amount of energy usage um, in the whole, um, you know, digital communications global ecosystem. Fascinating. And how much, how much that world, which probably has affected and changed our life more than anything in my lifetime, is totally dependent upon not just a lot of energy, but reliable energy. The massive data servers um, that are actually physical things that, that um, the iCloud depends upon don't really choose to be powered 100% by renewables. They need solid, coal-fired, reliable generation. Um, and another one he just wrote called Shale 2.0 um, about the shale revolution and the, the extent to which it is just beginning, just beginning. 
um, and a fascinating one. In his professional life, he is a, a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, uh, faculty fellow in the McCormick School of Engineering at Northwestern, CEO of, a, of the Digital Power Group, and uh, he served in the White House Science Office under President Reagan early in his year. Can you imagine if Mark was the President's science advisor instead of John Holdren? Uh, maybe that could happen. But Mark, thank you very much for coming, and we welcome to hear your remarks tonight. Thank you, Kathleen, for that uh, overly generous introduction. And uh, Brooke, thank you for holding off on the wine. I, I, was, I was the one that uh, made sure it didn't happen that way, because if people have been drinking you know, a little while ago, uh, they'd be sleeping now. <laughs> it's a long day, so yeah. It's no accident. Uh, I'm going I'm to talk about politics, because uh, the politics matter. And I'm going to talk about the politics of oil, uh, because the politics of oil uh, matter enormously. And I'm going to do it be all, not because I'm in Texas, uh, but it's relevant to Texas, but it's relevant to the United States. And it's relevant, in fact, to the entire free world. And it's relevant to the not so free world. It, it, and you can't, it's hard to talk about energy without some acknowledgement of uh, the, the horror that took place so recently in Paris. And not to, to trivialize it, but the, the linkages in the geopolitics are, are, are obvious and have been noted by other people from Paris to Syria and the Middle East, and we, we, you have doubtless know this, but ISIS is funded by the fact that it captured seven of the eight Syrian oil fields, and they sell the oil in the black market. Very difficult to track oil. Jimmy Carter tried to, remember, I don't know those of you who remember, that Jimmy Carter tried to, uh, to create a class, two classes of oil, oil that was new and oil that was old, and you would be criminally prosecuted for selling old oil that you got cheap for the price of new oil that you got, you know, it was a bizarre scheme. And, and people were prosecuted, as you, as you may recall. It was an Im invitation to corruption to create two pricing schemes to track a, a fungible commodity, because oil is like, like money, and it's uh, uh, almost infinitely fungible. So the, the idea that uh, Paris and ISIS are related to oil is not to ignore the other factors that have driven terrorism in the world. Uh, there's a lot. It's to say it's complicated, or uh, you remember what uh, Bush 43 said that it's, it's hard. To say it's hard is um, to trivialize it. Obviously, it's complicated, but equally obviously, it's about the oil. So when people said, as an invective, when President Bush and the Congress, which we need to remind our political foes, are agreed and went into Iraq, and the enemies of Bush said it's about the oil. The wrong response was to say, no, it's not. It was about the oil. No, no, no one really cares much, and I don't mean this as, a, as a, uh, uh, an unkind statement about the, pe about the good people of the Middle East, but the truth is, in the geopolitical scheme of things, no one really cares about the Middle East except for the fact of the oil. There's nothing there that's of any value to the world except the oil. There are no airplanes manufactured in the Middle East and exported to the world. There's no food exported to the world from the Middle East. There's no computers exported to the world from the Middle East. There's no Facebook that was been invented there. No transistors created. The list is rather long. There are, in fact, no patents being issued out of the Middle East, except for Israel. And when I say <laughs> my friend Dick Lindzen is making sure I don't, uh, I don't lump <laughs> our good friends in, in Israel into that category. And, and there, we know the reason that Israel is the exception. So when I say Middle East, I mean the Arab Middle East. Uh, that is not free. Israel is the, is the bright exception. But oil matters. I mean, oil doesn't just matter in the Middle East. It matters in Africa. It matters in the Arctic. That's the reason that the Russians pulled the stunt, the pulling a, putting a flag on the ocean floor at the North Pole. It matters in, in, in Central and South America. That's the reason that Venezuela uses its oil money and its oil to influence politics. It matters enormously. It doesn't matter, be it, it, it do and I'm here sort of defending oil the way my, good my other good friend, Will Happer, was defending carbon, the molecule. Seems odd to have to defend the molecule, as Will said. It uh, seems odd to defend a hydrocarbon. 
And I'm not talking about the moral case for fossil fuels, which, which is an admirable book by one of my other friends, right? It's, it's, but rather, let's just talk about w why it matters. And not because oil capitalists, big oil capitalists care. I mean, you know this. Most of the world's oil fields, most of the access to oil, most of the production in the world is not controlled by capitalists. It's controlled by statists. Governments control the oil. So this is not a story about defending capitalism, per se. I just want to talk about geopolitics and oil and why it matters, why it matters enormously. And if I would, were to give this speech 10 years ago, you would end on a depressing note because it matters a lot, it matters enormously, and has enormously frightening implications for the world in the future. And we would have had no options a decade ago, but now we have some options, which I'm going to talk about, and it may be obvious to you given the fact that I'm standing so close to the uh, Permian and the Eagleford. So let's talk about um, why, first, if I, if I might, it, and, it, and you're oil people, I'm going to tell you why oil matters. And, and, it, and it, you do have to remind yourself why oil matters. In fact, we have to remind uh, people in the geopolitical field why oil matters. There's a reason that the world produces and consumes 1,000 barrels of oil per second, right? This is, this is an astonishing number. There's a reason for that, and the reason isn't because it's a product that's looking for a consumer. It's consumers are consuming the product. And we know exactly how, what, what is consuming it, and there's a single answer for almost all of oil's use, almost all, it's transportation. Planes, cars, trucks, and ships. Transportation is oil-fired. It's almost exclusively oil-fired. All airplanes fly on oil. All ships are propelled by oil except for entertainment and racing in the America's Cup. And essentially, all cars are propelled by oil. And transportation technology is the single most important vector for freedom, mobility, commerce, and wealth that the world has ever seen. Nothing has had as big an impact, not even, even though Kathleen is right, the Internet is having a big impact, not even the Internet yet, not Google, not the cloud, not your iPhone, nothing has come close to impacting the nature of creation of wealth in the world except for oil-fired transportation. The ability for human beings to have phenomenal, unprecedented mobility and personal mobility is the reason why cars are purchased and used throughout the world at such a torrid pace, the second anybody has any money. And all commerce is oil carried. All commerce of people is oil carried. The whole world literally runs on oil. This sounds like a, an API commercial for oil, right? But the <laughs> <laughs> it is astonishing when I talk to business school students for the Adam Smith Society, for, you know, the Manhattan Institute, how few students even think about or recognize that simple factor. How many people really understand the extent and the depth of the importance of oil? So it, it, d dependencies matter, right? This, this, this is non-trivial. And we will use more oil in the future. I wanna, so I'm, I'm going to not talk about climate change at all. I'm not going to talk about the need to get off of oil. I'm, I'm invoking the Google and Gates uh, imperative. You know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, Google launched a program seven years ago, six years ago, to make a renewable energy cheaper than coal. Coal, you could say renewable energy cheaper than oil. Coal just happens to be a cheaper hydrocarbon than, than oil on average. Google, of course, is infinitely smart and has an infinite amount of money. Right? And so obviously they knew that they could do something that Exxon and Murray and others couldn't do because they're too stupid and didn't have enough money. <laughs> they, as you all, all I'm sure know, you, you must know this, they abandoned that program. And the engineers who headed the program up wrote, wrote a very uh, revelatory uh, article in a technical journal in which they said, now say, I'll tell you exactly what they said in the exact words they said. It, it can't be done. The technologies needed haven't been invented yet. And they didn't know how to invent them. Bill Gates, as I told, I think everybody was here earlier, Bill Gates' interview in Atlantic, not that he said it more directly and more clearly, we need new science. We need a miracle to displace hydrocarbons in general, and certainly the case for oil. So I'm, I'm going to, you don't have to argue about whether climate change is an apocalypse or not, whether how much it's warming or not warming, whether it's a conspiracy of scientists to fudge numbers. None of, none of that matters. You can agree with Bill Gates or not agree with Bill Gates, who, who professes that he's worried about uh, climate change because of hydrocarbons. But he does say, and Google has said, there will be oil. So no matter what is done, no matter what policies we implement, no matter how much money is spent, there's no amount of money that can be spent that will change the fact that just as the sun will rise tomorrow, more oil will be used. Not the same amount of oil, more will be used. 
Oil is the number one source of primary energy used by the world, period. Number two is coal. Coal rose rapidly in the last 15 years, largely because of China's electrification. Now think what's going to happen as China gets wealthier and India gets wealthier, as those nations' use of cars, which will all be oil-fired for reasons of physics that Bill Gates understands, what happens when those nations go from 30 to 60 cars per thousand people to what the West has, which, which is an average of 600 to 1,200 cars per thousand people? You notice the, the latter number was uh, bigger than the number of people because as people get wealthier, they have toy cars that they can have and drive on weekends. Think about what happens when billions of people start driving cars that use oil. This is what Gates understands. Oil matters. Oil is a profoundly critical commodity to the world. It is what has made commerce possible. It's how we ship everything. It's how 90% of manufactured goods are shipped. So think about this, this, this propelling of world wealth from oil fire transportation, what it's done. Since the 1973 Arab oil embargo, which is a pivotal event in every respect politically, it's what shocked the world, raised oil prices overnight 400%. Imagine if that happened today, a 400% price increase overnight. This is a, uh, it, it, there is a good reason that it shocked policymakers and they reacted with goofy legislation like the Energy Policy and Conservation Act. There was a reason for the reaction. It was a stunning political event on the part of the uh, Saudis and the Arab oil embargo. But since 1973, the world's economy has grown because of commerce, which is oil transported. It has grown 600 percent, the world's GDP. The share of that GDP, which is traded, has increased from 30 percent in 1973 to 60 percent today. So when you hear people who like or don't like globalization say there's globalization, boy, are they right. That's an astonishing transformation during the lifespan of energy policy in the West. So oil matters, right? And a third of all the oil that is consumed in the world is traded. And the share that gets traded will rise. It will rise for obvious reasons, because the places that produce the oil are not the necessarily the same places that consume the oil. So let's just stipulate oil matters. So then let's look at, from a geopolitical perspective, what the dependencies are, because the dependencies are what drives politics. And there's really couple of kind of dependencies. The first dependency is uh, where does the oil come from, right? Who's, who supplies oil into the traded markets? What matters is what goes into traded markets. If there's a small little closed economy and they're self-sufficient and they don't need, they don't import, they don't export, that doesn't matter. What matters at the global level is what's traded. So uh, more than a third of the world's oil consumption is traded and that percentage is rising. If we take the U.S. out of the equation because we're a big consumer, if we don't use our numbers, then you get the more than half of the world's oil is traded for the emerging and growing economies. So the trade in oil actually matters. Who supplies oil into the traded market? Well, we, we know the answer to that. You could probably guess, right? Sixty percent of all, sixty-five percent, in fact, of all oil that is sold in a traded market comes from two places, Russia and the Arab Middle East. Sixty-five percent of all traded oil comes from two places, those two. In fact, if we look at the hydrocarbon cousin, natural gas, sixty percent of all traded natural gas comes from two places, the same two places, Russia in the Middle East. And just as an additional sort of side factoid, in 10 years from now, the share of natural gas that is traded and moved on ships as LNG instead of in pipes will flip. More gas will be on ships being traded than moving in pipes. So very interesting geopolitical implications when you think through it. So the future, the future of the world up until recently was one in which two players were supplying oil into the geopolitical scene on the margin forever, Russia and the Middle East. And bear in mind, Russia has an economy the size of California, and Saudi Arabia has an economy the size of Il Illinois. So those two regions are controlling not only today's, but the future's marginal supply <coughs> of oil. And the marginal matters because it's on the margin where the consumers of the future get their oil. Another kind of dependency kind of matters here is choke points. Since the oil moves on ships, we don't have trains going globally. We don't have oil being flown around the world except by the military for forward operating bases. 99.99% of the world's oil that's traded is traded on ships. There are five choke points in the world where 90% of all the oil flows through. Four of those choke points are in the Middle East and one of them is the South China Sea, which would explain a lot of what's going on in the geopolitics of the South China Sea. It is, in the words of another friend of mine, it's the 
global interstate of commerce, something like 30 to 40 percent of all global commerce actually flows through ships on the South China Sea. And there's another dependency, the one we talked about the most since 1973, which is the dependency of the consuming nations on somebody else. That's all we've talked about since Nixon launched Project Independence. So the dependencies are, are important and instructive here geopolitically. China converted, right, you all know this, a couple of years ago from being a not dependent to a dependent net importer of oil and a net importer of natural gas. Europe is lost and hopeless. 90% of all their oil comes from somewhere else. Probably will forever. When I say they're hopeless, it's the near as I can tell it's, it's hopeless for Europe. If you go through nations of South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, the, the ratios and the percentages are similar. Dependencies are very high throughout the world on oil from somewhere else, and there are no replacements for oil. Oil is essential to the transportation system, not just to the world, but to those nations as well. So if you think about that construct, it explains why people who say, when we go to the Middle East, or we're in Africa, or we're in the South China Sea, and they use it as an insult, supposedly, it's about the oil. Yes, in fact, it is indeed exactly about the oil, because it matters so much to the free flow and the functioning of the world's economy. So what's different today? This is what I've just told you is history. This is, what's, this, is, this is where we are. Something is different, though. We know what the different thing is. Two things are different today than any time in modern history, certainly in modern history uh, since the Arab oil embargo of 1973. One is a change in the locus of demand, of the growth in demand. All growth in demand is all other than Europe and the United States. We are not the world's largest consuming, largest, fastest growing consumer of oil or energy of any kind. Our growth rates are essentially stagnant in oil consumption. We'll, we'll probably increase our use slightly. All of the growth for the demand for oil is in the emerging economies. This is, this is geopolitically non-trivial considering how much of the e growth in the commerce of the world is in emerging economies. The second thing that's changed, which is equally profound, of course, is the locus of growth in supply. So as Kathleen said, and all of you know, uh, the, the shale revolution shocked everybody. It didn't, it, I want to say it didn't shock me because we wrote this in our book 10 years ago uh, and we called it right for the right reasons. But I will say that I was surprised at the extent of the change th in its velocity. N never before in the history of the oil industry has this much oil supply been added in such a short time anywhere in a century. Four million barrels per day of addition to supply in roughly seven and a half years is unprecedented in the history of the modern world. This is an astonishing amount of energy. So this has changed the game. It's changed the game we know because of what Saudi Arabia has done. You, you've been reading the stories. That, that the trope is that the Saudis you know, engineered the oil price collapse. Right? That's, um, well, there's partial truth to that. But if you draw the graph, it's a simple graph of the price of oil when it drops. And then on the same graph, draw a line of when Saudi Arabia increased their production. They increased their production after the price had collapsed. Now they the, the OPEC members collectively increased production by almost a million barrels per day in, in the face of a collapse because the United States oversupplied the world by four million barrels per day. So what were they doing? Well, they're probably, I think what they're doing is an experiment. I think they're doing part, partly market discipline to drive the expensive players out. And I don't think they care who the expensive players are. They care about market share for them. Uh, they care about their ability to maintain markets, and they've been doing that by discounting oil below Brent. And they have maintained all their market share, by the way. In every market they sell into, but one, they've been winning, maintaining market share, except China. Russia has been beating Saudi Arabia in exports to China, which is doesn't change the equation very much in terms of the geopolitics, but it does tell you what the game is on the Saudis' part. It's about market protection, market creation. They only have, they're a monoculture. So what could we do different, right? I mean, if you think of where the world sits with this dynamic now in place, and when the Saudis know and Russia knows what's happened, they understand what's happened in the shale fields. In fact, I would argue that the politicians and the analysts in Saudi Arabia, in Riyadh and Moscow, actually understand it better than our politicians. I think they've done a better job of actually studying the nature of the shale fields because they have nothing else to sell. Right? They have to study this. You know 70% of all of Russia's export revenues come from selling oil and gas. Essentially 100% of Saudi Arabia's and the rest of OPEC. So they, these, 
understanding what's going on in the United States is of first order importance. What they, what they understand now is there's a change, another change in the characteristic of the biggest single swing supplier, the United States, is that it's a high velocity supplier. And it's a high velocity supplier in two ways, which is unprecedented again in modern oil markets. If you're Saudi Arabia or Russia and you're looking at what the future demand and supply for oil is, you, you're working with two slow moving data sets, ignoring exogenous events like big wars or financial collapses. So there's a financial collapse, then you get a rapid decrease in consumption, and of course prices you know, respond appropriately. If you get a big war, it takes supply away, prices go up. But those are ep episodes are brief. What you're really planning for if you're an oil monoculture is what's going to happen over the next decade. And big billion dollar oil projects take a decade to plan, implement, and they take a long time to finance, particularly in status countries. It's slow moving. So you have a pretty good model of what's going to happen to supply and demand. And you also know what demand's going to be roughly because, again, ex absent exogenous events like uh, an economic collapse, we know, just as much as we know the sun's going to rise, there'll be more people. They will, on average, have more wealth. And when they get more wealth, they buy cars and they fly in airplanes. That's been happening for about 100 years, and it's going to happen for another 100 years. You can take it to the bank, literally. So they, these two variables you can put in with some, uh, you know, like the climate models. There's some uh, error to it, but you got a pretty good idea. Until you come along with an infrastructure like the shale infrastructure, which is not funded multi-billion dollar projects by status class banks, but, but funded by small banks, small entrepreneurs. The American capital system, which is extraordinarily fluid, resilient, and diverse. And the oil is produced by drilling thousands and thousands of wells, e each individually that doesn't cost very much. So decisions are made by thousands of people on the fly, without any control, without any top-down control, without any long-term planning. If prices rebound, I'll pick my favorite number is 55. Um, people who are smarter about oil than I am in the trading world say it's 65. But that's a difference without a meaning in the real geopolitical world that we're talking about. If you have numbers like 55 to $65 a barrel that you believe will stay there for just a year, the quantity of drilling that that will stimulate in the United States will shock people. First thing that will happen is we'll unleash the so-called frack logs. So 5,000 unstimulated wells that have been drilled will come online if prices stay there in months, not years, in months, some in cases weeks. There's about 3 million barrels per day of potential production in the fac frack log. So you, you, you know how big a number that is, right? This is bigger than most countries produce, right, except for three in the world. And that's without drilling new wells. And they'll come online, in a sense, overnight. And we'll, we'll see a replay of what happened in the gas market when, the, when, get, when shale gas first came on. Remember what happened, right? Everybody rushed into the Marcellus, started drilling, and we collapsed the price of gas below two bucks. What happens? Well, a lot of people pull back, just not going to bother, turn it off. And in a very short time, production sags, price came back up, you know, the threes, boom, drilling again. So what you have is this, if you're an engineer, it's called a regulator, right? It's a little flywheel thing going on. Every time the price pops up, people can rush in and make lots more. Price sinks, I just wait a little after it's and then I'll go back in. Hundreds and hundreds of companies doing this in an uncontrolled way. Nothing frightens a kleptocrat more than a thousand entrepreneurs, right? That's what the shale field represents. It's a combination of the velocity of the technology and the velocity of the capital markets is unparalleled. Yes, we're going through an adjustment period. Yep, a lot of them will go out of business in the next year because cons consolidations will happen. Some bankruptcies will be accelerated next year as prices probably stay relatively low. But it won't change the fundamentals. It doesn't change the fact that the United States already has nearly a trillion dollars of private investment in the infrastructure of, of a shale industry that didn't exist 10 years ago. This is frightening to the Saudis and the Russians, which is why they're doing a lot of what they're doing and why, you know, I could s I've said this before, so I'm, I'm not... I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but it would be crazy if Putin and the Saudis weren't funding anti-fracking movements. It'd, it'd be crazy not to do it. I mean, it's, it'd be irrational not to do it. Of course you'd fund that. Come on. You want to slow it down. So that's where we are today. What would, you, what would we do with that? What in it, so going back and so wrapping up with here's what do we do? Well, I, again, we'll re-invoke the Gates and Google imperative. The future, there will be more oil. And we'll add to that, it'll be consumed elsewhere. In the, in, the, in the growth paradigm, and it'll be consumed increasingly in high-risk areas, in choke points, in regions where the oil matters to the people desperately. What we have is a problem in America. 
and I'm, I'm going to say this in a serious way, because it's the inverse of what Carrie said, which was astonishingly we're infantile. I'll use infantile. So, astonishingly infantile, to say that the ISIS was fueled by climate change. <laughs> it's, it's it's not a nice climate in a lot of parts of where they live. So I suppose you could make that argument, but not in terms of driving SUVs in Texas. I said, but but let me be serious. The, the climate wars that we're in, which are political wars, are increasing the risk of real wars. And the reason they're increasing the risk of real wars is because they've made it not only déclassé to defend and like and promote the use of oil and production of oil, they've made it an anathema in the political sphere to look like you're getting into bed with big oil. When in fact what should be happening in America right now is that we should be using this new tool, the shale infrastructure, as a geopolitical weapon. And I mean a soft weapon. So I'll, I'll commend to you two, uh, two op-eds written in the la this year, one by Henry Kissinger, who knows something about geopolitics, who said in this very long op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, I know Steve knows this one, where he was basically responding implicitly to what Obama was saying about he was, but he was, he was doing the equivalent of Nixon to China. And of course, the op-ed was essentially saying, I, I, I knew China and I knew Nixon, <laughs> like the Reagan line, and you're not either Nixon or China. What he, what he wrote was that the, the, the United States needs to decide what it wants to do on the geopolitical stage in the 21st century because it's a new and different world and probably, and I'm paraphrasing, paraphrasing, the single greatest challenge will be the Middle East. Leon Panetta wrote an op-ed in which Leon Panetta said a very similar thing, but he was more direct about my thesis. And he said, when we have these challenges in this new world, and it's a different world, it's different because of the scale and nature of where growth is and who the players are, we reflexively turn to our military power, he wrote, when we should be turning to our soft power and the power of, and he wrote specifically, if you didn't remember this piece, the power of American energy abundance and our ability to use our oil and gas for geopol geopolitical influence. Everyone else in the world that's an oil and gas producer that exports uses their oil and gas as a geopolitical tool, not just an economic tool. That is what those nations do. It's not an immoral thing to do. It's actually considered what it, it, in the old parlance, that's the carrot, right? The military is the stick. You have a carrot. We're not using any carrots. We're just using sticks. It's not a good way to operate in the world. So here's what, what, what could happen. And, I, and this is slightly naive, uh, but it's not impossible. Imagine a president of the United States gets elected, and this is where I think my good friend Rupert Garwal is correct about this next election. This is a, this is a, people say all the time this is the most important election in our lifetime, and you hear that every, every election cycle. This is actually an important election. <laughs> this one, this one's, it won't end the world, but it's going to be a pivot. One way or the other, this election is a pivot. Right, we're, we're not going to end, America's not going to disappear, but we're going we're to go in one of two directions which are very different or orthogonal to each other. Imagine though, a president is elected and within a month or so of being in office, he um, holds a press conference and gives a policy speech. And the speech is, I don't know, could be in Texas, but probably not because he doesn't want to look like he's in big oil's pocket. He's going to go to Colorado. On the plains of Colorado with the oil fields, the shale fields behind him. Maybe Wyoming. They have a spectacular shale fields in Wyoming. And he'll give a speech, and it'll be a speech that will, I could write the speech. In fact, I've written the speech. It's my next paper, but so <laughs> we'll publish it in January. I've written this speech. For, I, I've written one presidential speech in my entire life. The only speech that Reagan gave on energy I had a hand in writing. I wasn't the only writer. So I've, I've, I've written one. So I have some experience. Not bad. One. Peggy Noonan writ, wrote hundreds, I think, but I did, I did one. Uh, but imagine a president says something like, the world needs oil, right? Oil is critical to the free people of the world. It's, it's critical. He says in a paragraph to what I said at the outset, why it's so important. So as President of the United States, today I'm announcing that the, United, the U.S. energy policy and oil policy in particular will be restructured and shifted so that our goal is to become within the decade, it's a familiar timeline, right? Within a decade, one of the major exporters of oil to world markets. And goes on to explain why. He'll genuflect to environment, say, well, of course, we won't violate any environmental laws. He'll say, in fact, he would say, and I would write the speeches, well, we will double down on research to find alternatives to oil on research. 
More scientists, not more cylindrists. We'll double down like Bill Gates wants. I'm inviting Bill Gates to the White House to help me bring more billionaires in to double down on this research to find mir miracles. We want that. But in the meantime, just as sure as the sun will rise tomorrow, the world will use more oil and it's going to be getting oil from the duopoly of the Middle East Arabs and Russians. That has to end and it ends today. Now, what would that do? So, uh, the Greens will go crazy, right? Frothing at the mouth, but this doesn't matter. They're going to go crazy anyway. And we're going to use the oil anyway. It would uh, probably cause oil prices to go down overnight and then they recover. Because one thing that the world's markets understand, this would really rattle markets, the traders everywhere. It would really rattle the folks in Riyadh and Moscow. Is that they know that when the United States sets its mind to do something like that, it can be done. Just as, as people vilified Star Wars uh, missile defense when I was in that White House. We have missile defense. It took a lot of money and a little time, but it's done. And the Russians knew it. We know that the Russians knew it, and they believed it when that announcement was made by Reagan. If the president did that, it would move markets. It would create enthusiasm. Now, obviously, you'd have to have a caveat. He'd say, he would say something like, I've instructed my secretaries of energy, interior, not the EPA, right? Energy, interior, <laughs> and commerce to bring to me a plan that presents what I can do by executive action to facilitate regulations and expedite things and to present to me legislation to take to the Congress so that we don't just repeal the ban against exports, but we actually have a Department of Export Assistance, just like we do in agricultural fields and have had for a century. This, this would profoundly move markets. And then you would do this, he or she, don't think Carly's going to make it. I like Carly a lot. I thought if it's a Republican, it's probably a he. I'm just saying. Oh, like maybe it's going to be your guy, Rubio, right? He, he, would, he would say, uh, I recognize that this will uh, create potential for the need for private-public collaborations on advancing technologies because the effect of this will be to drive world prices down. And the only way we can compete in that world is with technology. With better and better technology, we can make oil cheaper and cheaper, which will benefit the world and the world's consumers and the world's poor. And our American entrepreneurs and all their employees will have jobs and be profitable in a low-price environment because of the advances of technology, which we know are possible and that have happened in the last decade without our assistance. Now we're here to help. So you'd be accused of getting subsidies, right? And we've spent the last 20 years apologizing for getting subsidies that we don't have. So I, you know, I'm going to be slightly facetious and say, you know, if we're going to be accused of having subsidies, why not have some subsidies? Right? We subsidize the military because it's important geopolitically. We subsidize the Strategic Petroleum Reserve because it's important geopolitically. So there are forms of subsidies which are perfectly acceptable to conservative Republicans in my, in my orbit because they're not really subsidies. They have a geopolitical impact and they really move the meter. It is possible today that we could do that. Could the United States increase its oil production by another 5 million barrels per day, technically? I, I, have, I, I know for a fact that there is no doubt that can be done. The caveats you'll hear from the EMP guys is related to, to two things. One, the regulations that impede me. You know, I, I did 4 million barrels per day, net, net, but the regulations are getting worse, not easier. And they'll say, when the price collapses, because we oversupplied it last time, man, when it drops to 20, what are you going to do for me? There are creative ways to manage that in commodity markets. And that's, that would be the challenge to his Department of Commerce and to the industry to come up and the Treasury Department with ways to manage the oil volatility to maintain a, a strategically critical domestic industry. This, this is a, a phenomenal opportunity. Could not have imagined doing that. If I had said what I just said, it would have sounded like science fiction 10 years ago. It is doable. It is sellable. It is technically feasible. The only thing that would prevent it is the, the will to actually push it and to make it happen. Thank you.